about Alabama first off, just their style of play? And what you yeah, well, they, they make it really hard with their pressure and their athleticism. You know, they're going to, um, you know, bird dog you, guard the basketball, you know, full court. Um, try to deny the pass inbound and then just really hawk the basketball and then just get you out of rhythm, you know, more than anything. Use, they have a lot of interchangeable pieces. They have a lot of quickness. They have experience. They don't have a great deal of experience together, obviously, um, because they've, they've had a lot of transfers, but uh, they, they, they play extremely hard and uh, they really try to get you at their pace. Their guards are very good. Estrada, Sears, um, Nelson causes a lot of problems with his size and his length, but like both of their bigs are very athletic and long. The guards that come in can score. It's very similar, you know, to our team in terms of you got to give a lot of respect for their guys that come off the bench because on a lot of other teams they would start. You know, good players, talented, uh, can drive it, can score. They do a great job of kind of manipulating the defense through their ball screen actions and uh, really just you know work you downhill. They shoot a lot of threes, they want to get to the rim. You can see that they're uh, analytically driven, you know, trying to get to the free throw line, which they do, trying to get their layups and trying to get their threes. Can you put your foot on a few things your team has really done well against pressure? Well, so at times we've done a really good job of taking care of it. You know, well, that's any, what I mean. Yeah, anytime we take care of it, no matter what the other team has done, we've had success. You know, just you know, trying to limit our turnovers and get quality shots each time down. Um, you know, a lot of different things that come with that. You know, are you is it your passes out of the post? Is it your passes off the dribble? Is it, you know, careless catches? You know, are you getting violations? Um, are you getting offensive fouls? And so, like, a lot of times people take turnovers as one thing, when in reality it could be anywhere from four to eight different things. And so, like, trying to just put those in those boxes, um, and just improve on it and, and just keep working on it. You never, you know, I always say that about rebounding and taking care of the basketball. Like you never 100% get that puzzle complete. It just never is your, even when you have success with it or a string of games where you're successful at it, you always have to work on those two items. Lance has been a game changer. It seems like having that secondary ball handler can accelerate past people. Yeah, he's, you know, he's really helped us from a defensive standpoint you know, with his quickness and, and guarding people and, and also giving us uh, another ball handler. Um, Andy's done a great job, you know, especially in transition of knocking down shots. He's really done a good job of, you know, taking those. And for him, I think he has, he gets to a feel sometimes to when he shoots shots and he shouldn't do that. You know, just, you know, organically let the game come to you. If that means you shoot 15 times, great. If you shoot five times, great. But like, he'll sometimes have some nervous twitch shot selection and he's just got to take him. Other night against Iowa, you know, he was taking rhythm threes. He got one pull up, but he was just living at the rim. You know, he was just, he would just kept getting layups and, and that's what we need. You know, we, we need him to be able to get to the rim, get us layups, get to the free throw line, but also just putting that burden on the defense. That kind of, Diagonal throw ahead pass to the shallow mm -hmm. corner there. Is that something you want them doing, or is that a high risk pass against somebody like Alabama? Are you talking about when someone presses us or in the half court? When somebody's pressing, when somebody's pressing. Press, oh, no, no. It's, we've always worked on that from day one. Anytime people zone press us, that's what we're working on. We used to do it with Carson and, and Klein. They were really good at it. Carson would drive it. Sometimes we would throw that diagonal and throw it right into Isaac. Carson would drive it and let Isaac kind of use that post up screen and go get layups. But we've always tried to get that diagonal pass, you know, with those guys because it, you know, when they overdo it, they get aggressive and you can do that. Now you're in a lot of space when you catch it. You know, you, it's, they really have to retreat at that time and whether they're coming back to a zone or a man. Alabama has guards that can really get up the court, especially after mm -hmm. having a rebound. Is the focus for you guys to get to your matchups or you just want anyone on the ball as quick as possible? Yeah, you want your matchup. You want your matchup if you can get that. But sometimes you obviously can't. So especially if somebody has fallen down or, you know, something has happened where they get buried on the baseline. And that's why we have rules to when shots go up where you're, what you're supposed to do and where you're supposed to go so we can set our defense if something crazy happens. And then you were talking about coaching for Zach Eady after the game last time. How much 
the more you do this, it becomes about the guys even beyond win and losses. Obviously, you want to win, but how much are you just coaching for your players? Right. Yeah, I think it's a little bit different for us. I think it's, um, you know, coaching is, is, is tough at times because, you know, you're not being selfish if you want something a certain way, you know, but once it, it happens, you have to be, you know, accepting to that. And to be able to have that role definition is so important on teams. Well, if you've been around people longer, it's easier because they, you know, you have that trust. And that's, you know, that's coaching. You know, coaching is telling them the truth and then, you know, treating them the right way. And sometimes, I don't think coaches sometimes understand that. But if you say certain things to get them in recruiting and you get them under false pretenses, it's hard for them to trust you. And so, like, even at times when they don't, agree with you if you just tell them the truth you know they're going to respect that in the long run so I, I think that's an important piece um you know to understand have you always felt comfortable with that or is that something that you kind of get better at with no it's um you know you don't want to hit a guy between the eyes especially in front of other people that's going to lose their confidence like you just don't want that because you know how you felt as a player like you can't ever forget about how you felt so like but if you don't say it you're doing them an injustice so you got to be able to say it but you also got to be diplomatic about it um, they got to know that you're on their side and then sometimes they're just simply not going to feel that way if they don't play as much they don't shoot as much or they don't play at all. They're just not going to feel that way. And so that's understandable, but you got to keep it on those lines because you got to have that trust. Grant Nelson is one of those unicorn guys. Does he match up? Say it again. We'll get with you. Sorry. Grant Nelson is mm -hmm. one of those unicorn type of guys. Mm -hmm. Does he match up to fours? Yeah, he's a good player. Like they've played against good players. Um, you know, he's athletic, he's long, he can drive the basketball, he can knock down perimeter shots, he can block shots. So he's very versatile. They can go small with him at the five if they want. Um, he could play a wing, you know, if he wanted also. So it, um, yeah, you just, you know, you got to respect, you know, his, his skill set and, you know, and try and keep him in front of you, try to get him out of rhythm. You know, but like that's easier said than done. Like he's a good player. You know, Estrada, Sears, they're good players. They have they have a good group of guys. Everything okay with Gillis's ankle, mm -hmm. back, whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope so. You know, he's a tough dude. So like, you know, he'll he'll be ready to go. How do you handle the prep for? You go from bam, 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 just playing all these games in a row, right. and now you you don't play for six days, and then you don't play for seven days after this, and then yeah. after Christmas, obviously, it's it's the gauntlet. So. Yeah, well, I think that's the kind of the mental and the physical break there for two days. You know, after we play Iowa, you know, taking two days off and trying to get those guys some rest. But now, gotta have a good practice today and tomorrow, and then uh, get ready for finals. You know, just kind of keep things in perspective. Get ready for finals and not really think about you know, your next opponent at, at that time and, until you get there, really on Thursday and Friday before we play on Saturday. And by the time you get to Thursday, there's three days of possible finals that went by. So about half of your team, probably a little bit more, is, is, is done at that time too. So that helps a little bit. And Ethan had maybe his best game against Iowa and, mm -hmm. and didn't score the basketball, but this is a guy you've given a different role to every year and it seems like Right. kind of blossoms in whatever you, you challenge him. So. Yeah, he definitely helped us. I, I thought he, he was very active. I thought defensively he did a good job. Um, he didn't knock down shots, but I thought he moved the basketball and got it where it needed to be. And so, like, he's, you know, he understands that that piece of it. Like, he understands the details of taking on, you know, somebody defensively, but also, you know, being efficient on the offensive end and getting the ball where it needs to be. Do you anticipate more of these right over the border games becoming a thing in college basketball since uh, teams with international guys can be in aisle stuff. Right. Yeah, I, I think there's going to be a lot of things that open up. You know, I, I think you see some different things in the summer, right? You know, we've played in the World University games in the summer. I think you see different, you know, MTEs jumping out. You know, we're going to a different one next year um, in, in San Diego. So just, you know, they've always been there. Mm -hmm. But I think people are just starting to, you know, think more outside the box and trying to do things to, you know, to play quality opponents and also play them in, in kind of venues that you think is going to kind of match up to your Big Ten tournament or match up to the NCAA tournament. With Ethan and Camden, you have a lot of length that you can bring off the bench to guard the ball. How does that kind of just 
manifest in a game and you can throw a different look at them. Right. I, I think for us on our front court, you know, you have, we can do a lot of different things, you know, and I think with Ethan, you know, he's a guy who's played small ball four with, and he's also played the point mm -hmm. and he's been able to defend both of those. And, you know, we, I remember starting him in the second half of the Rutgers game a couple years ago and Harper had a really good uh, first half. And, you know, he came in and was able to do that. And then we subbed him in in the same year to go to the Sweet 16 and we would beat Texas and he guarded Marcus Carr. Mm -hmm. And so I think that versatility, not just to play the position, but to be able to guard the position, I think really helps. And then, you know, Caleb's done a really good job in ball screen defense and being active and uh, just being around the basketball. And, and, and given that effort with his athleticism. How has uh, being, this is gonna sound like a stupid question, but you've known Zach a long time now. Mm -hmm. How has being Canadian shaped him? Well, I think, you know, he, he had that, um, I don't know if it was stubbornness or what it was to, to be the, the world's largest, or I should say tallest pitcher. You know, he, he wasn't gonna let, the world was telling him, you should play basketball. Yeah. The world was right, <laughs> um, but like that's what he wanted. He liked baseball and he liked hockey, and so like that's what he was going to do. Then obviously he just kept growing. And, but I, I think the you know he has a level of toughness to him, you know, and, and from a competitive standpoint, um, it kind of depends on each game, like kind of getting his engine going. Like you know he starts off a game and gets going, and that doesn't necessarily mean uh, scoring the basketball. I think there's an element of people that are that big and that tall to where you get a little passive or you get a little timid because of how the game gets called. He's learned to be able to play and, and play without fouling for the most part. Um, so I, I think that, you know, is, is, is pretty intelligent because it's hard to do, but he also embraces the physicality of the game. And I would think that's, you know, his background really lends to that. You know, the hockey background really lends to that because he is a physical player. He's not someone who's just big and stands out there. Like, he, he fights to get offensive <coughs> rebound position. He goes to the glass every time. Like, he gives that effort. And not all big guys will do that. You know, they'll, they'll take 10 to 20% of the shots off and just not go to the glass. But, you know, he, he's always trying to post strong. And he's always trying to get on that glass. Also, just kind of being a basketball outsider all those years. It yeah. seems like it's been a big part of who he is and why he's been successful. Yeah. Well, he's coachable. He doesn't have that element of, like, knowing everything or, like, you know, the world anointing him when he's 14, 15, 16 years old, like he's the next, you know, coming. It's what, it's what shaped him, you know, because you're humble and you're modest and, you know, you listen to people when it comes to coaching. You listen to the details of things because deep down he really didn't know. You know, he had to go to IMG and that was great for him. And he came here and he's really been able to – to improve in our system and improve with Coach Brantley and Coach Johnson and our, you know, our whole coaching staff. So like those guys have done a good job with him. But it's also a two-way street. You know, he he embraces coaching and he takes it in and competes and watches a lot of film. He's got to the point now where he goes out and has twenty-five and ten, and that's expected. I mean, correct. How rare is it to get to that point where you know if he has seventeen, it's like he had an off night. Right. Well, when it comes to uh, points, it is an off night, but like. He's always been an unselfish guy, and each team is going to handle him differently. And that's what we say, you know, just take what they give you. If they want to play one-on-one, -on -one, be aggressive. If they want to double you, pass the basketball. Like, don't, don't get past that because you can always rebound, you can always run, you can always do other things. And then when you do those other things, he gets fouled so much. Like, now you can eat points in other areas to where, like, it doesn't all have to be from a post-up. You know, it could be from dives. It can be from offensive rebounds. It can be from transition, you know, things of that nature. But no, he's, you know, put the bar pretty high. And I've always said it like his comparison is himself. Like that, you know, that that's himself. And so that's what an average is, right? So if you average 24 and 12, like someone says he gets 24 and 12, and it's like, he just had an okay game. No, he had a great game. He just <laughs> got his averages. So it doesn't mean he had an average game. It just, because there's more to, to the game than that, even though those are important parts of the game. You've got back-to-back -back kind of specialty games, big opponents, unusual spots. Does that help your team kind of simulate preparing for other games yeah. like tournament and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, anytime you have games of this nature and you're playing high-level people in different venues, I think just those experiences really help.